So hello and a warm welcome to the Refreshing Views Observatory. For those of you new here, my name is Mark Radici. Now what I love about making these astronomy videos is the chance to bring a device and experience from observers from all different parts of the world. And today I'm joined by Michael Rector from Adirondack Astronomy. And Michael is a very keen, active observer, keen sketcher of the deep sky and an observer of the moon. And today he's going to talk us through his equipment, his eyepieces, his observing techniques and some of the equipment he's bought. So grab yourself pencil and paper and there's lots of advice and tips as we chat through. So as always don't forget to subscribe and I look forward to bringing you more videos as we explore the night sky. All right sounds good. Cool right so, so Michael welcome welcome to Refreshing Views and uh, whereabouts in the world are you? I am located in Plattsburgh, New York. I'm about an hour south of uh, Montreal and two hours north of Albany. So you're all ready for the winter weather, are you? Oh yeah, I'm right next to Lake Champlain. I was out with my telescope last night and it dropped down to about 33 degrees last night. I had a nice frosty telescope. So what, what, is, what is the weather like at the moment then? Um, it's, I think we're at the mid forties. Sorry, I'm in Fahrenheit here. I can't, I can't do the conversion in my head though, so. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we're looking forward to winter. Well, I'm the only one in my family who's pleased we're going to have winter soon. And the rest of the family... <laughs> yeah, I think I'm the only one that's also pleased about winter. Everyone's <laughs> like, oh no, it's getting dark early now. And I'm like, good, I can get out with my telescope right after work. I can go out for like four hours and be home by 10. <laughs> yes, yes. Eat me back at a reasonable hour. So I was talking to some Canadian astronomers the other day and they were saying that, you know, that during the summer you've got the hot days, you get the forest fires, you get the mosquitoes and the black flies. Is it the same for you? Oh yeah, really? yeah. Mosquitoes are horrible. Um, smoke isn't usually too bad. We might get a few days here and there where the smoke really ruins the the night sky. But I've never I've never really smelt the smoke in the air, so it's never been super strong. Just enough to kind of block out the the dimmer nebula. That's funny though, because before I got into astronomy, I didn't even know that in the UK you guys even got clear skies. I just yeah. thought it rained all the time. <laughs> <laughs> well, it always is clear when I'm busy with work oh, and so yeah so yeah so i mean you think i suppose so in defense i mean people like william herschel i mean he discovered what two and a half thousand deep sky objects oh and yeah he he lived you know 50 miles away or whatever it is so so what, what's the sky conditions like where you are so we talked about the weather what's the, what are the sky conditions like for you are you in the city or are you in the countryside um, well, I live in the city and I've actually just recently started taking my telescope out to a darker sky site. So where I live, I'm about a Bortle 6 and the sky or the site that I went to last night is a Bortle 4 and it's like a completely new sky when you get there. It's amazing. <laughs> I actually kind of got lost. I was like, where are my guide stars? I can't find them. <laughs> so for people who don't know, there's a Bortle 6, that's a... a city light pollution yeah. isn't it and, and then bottle four yeah. you're in a rural relatively dark skies aren't you yeah yeah and um since the canadian borders close by to the north especially at the new site i was at that's like a 20 minute drive so it's like halfway to canada is where i was at from where i live and uh you can actually see the lights from the canadian border all along the northern skies so if you're trying to look north you don't want to go further north because Canada's border. <laughs> yeah, okay. Right, so we talked about the sky conditions then. So um, so I met you or we, we sort of started chatting through the astronomy, there's a sketching Facebook group and that you post online as well, your wonderful sketches and stuff. So my first question to you then is, with this wonderful world of digital imaging, why on earth are you looking through your telescope? And I can see your telescope in the background. Why on earth <laughs> are you looking through the eyepiece and not okay. taking pictures like all other amateur astronomers seem to be doing? Well, that's funny because when I first got my first telescope, imaging was the thing I wanted to do. I want, I was trying to figure out how to hook up a point and shoot camera to the eyepiece because I was like, people need to see this. Other people need to see what I'm seeing. So I, I was trying to figure out a way to do it. And I actually got really into astrophotography for quite a while. And the longer, the more and more I got into it, I got pics in sight and I just, I was doing all the, the processing and really, I just kind of felt burnt out from all the, the the nights where I'd go out for three hours of imaging, only to find out that the data was useless. So that was an entire night wasted. And then on nights that were good, or at least they look good coming straight off the camera, when I stacked them, the light pollution would wash things out. And it just, it was getting frustrating. So I kind of took a break from that and was like, well, 
maybe I should just sketch. If I draw something, that's not a wasted night. Mm -hmm. I sat down, I observed an object for 30, 40 minutes straight, which most of the time when you put an eyepiece in, you kind of put your eye up to it, kind of look at it and then move on to the next target. This makes you sit there and look at it a little bit longer and and like the faint nebula or faint galaxies, you can really start seeing more and more detail the longer you have your eye up to the eyepiece. And I really was like, well, a lot of people I've seen online are like, well, what can I see through my telescope? And I figure sketching is the best way to really represent what you as a person are going to see when you put your eye up to the eyepiece. That's why I got into sketching. And I, yeah. I haven't completely given up on imaging, but I'm still in a break period. <laughs> yeah, because there's some guys in our club who do, you know, they'll set the camera up and running over there. And yep. they'll be out here with their binoculars or their Dobsonian telescope and stuff like that. But uh, I did hear someone say the other day, he said uh, that there's less bother with a dobber. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And, and uh, another thing with, with imaging is you need power. And if I'm going to a dark sky spot, I don't have portable power. So right. that kind of stops me from doing that. I mean, I could easily go and purchase something, but I'm really enjoying sketching. It's yeah. really relaxing and it, it really helps me unwind after a long week or a long day or whenever I go out. It's just, it's nice. It's almost therapeutic to sit there at the eyepiece. Yeah, the, it's, it can be stressful imaging. I mean, I know other people go out and say that it's very relaxing for them and more power to them by just, for me, myself, I feel like it's really frustrating to set up the tripod, polar align, and then and then do an all-star polar align on your mount, or I don't know, I have a CG5 mount, so I don't know if they still call it all-star polar line, but do the all-star and then, which, you know, if you've got an hour to waste, that's okay. But right. a lot of times I'm kind of on a time budget, you know, I set up and I just want to get to it and be done in two or three hours, so. Yeah. The pictures they do produce are absolutely wonderful. Oh and yeah. Just detect stuff that we can't, you know, you and I can't see or can only see under very extreme conditions, can't they? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I, that's one of the reasons I do still love imaging and, and I will never say that I'm not an imager, but I'm currently not an imager, if that makes sense. Yeah. Like, I, I don't know. I, I would like to still do more imaging at some point in time, just because sure. all that fainter detail you can pull out that you just can't see with the eye. Gotcha. Now that makes, that makes sense, doesn't it? Um, and I say, it doesn't, I've always said to people, it doesn't really matter what you do. It's a hobby. There's no right or yeah, wrong way to exactly. do it. It's whatever, whatever attracts you and whatever interests you. So I see you've got a telescope behind you then. So what have you got? What's your, what's your setup? This is an Apertura AD12. So that's a 12 inch Newtonian telescope. So and a, uh, I just six. got this in June. So it's still new to me and I'm yeah. still, I yeah. wanted to do a review on it. I did an unbox and a build video out over on my YouTube channel. And I said that I was going to do a review and that, that was back in June. I just haven't gotten around to doing the review yet, but it's still in the works. <laughs> so, so what are your, so you've used it a few times. And so what is your sort of feedback? What's your thoughts on it so far? Oh, I, I love the scope. Um, when I first got it, the secondary mirror was way out of alignment with the eyepiece and it was actually really far back. So you can only see like half the mirror. So I had to push it more towards the primary mirror, which was something I've never done before. So I was kind of afraid of that. And um, the eyepiece it came with was a 30 millimeter wide field, two inch eyepiece, wow. which was my first two inch eyepiece. And I have to say, I am very impressed with the views. I ended up going and buying another aperture eyepiece, a 38 millimeter. This thing's like a hand grenade. <laughs> I mean, it's like, I thought you were gonna pick up your coffee cup then, you know, when you... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, a, I'm loving the two inch eyepieces though, the wider fields, especially cause uh, I think this is 1,520 millimeter focal length, so. So it's not super wide field, so the wider eyepieces and the wider field of view really helps with that. So that's a 12, 12 inches is a lot of glass though, isn't it? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I have a friend who has a 16 inch and he let me borrow his back in March, I wanna say. And the views through it were amazing. I was seeing things from my Bortle 6 skies that I've never seen before through an eyepiece. And I almost bought a 16 inch until I borrowed his. It was so heavy. <laughs> I was like, I would never use this thing if I owned it. So, so I went you to say the just well. the logistics of it, just lifting yeah. and shifting it. 
Yeah, it was so heavy. And uh, the telescope that I borrowed was actually signed by uh, David H. Levy. Really? Oh, wow. Yeah. Another yeah. reason he to get to Canada. Canada. Yeah, he used to host uh, star parties here in the Adirondacks, okay. uh, Adirondack Astronomy Retreat. They haven't in the last couple of years, but yeah, he used to host parties and my friend was there and and I guess that scope's been through like three or four different people oh, and so he's cool. the current person with it and he let me borrow it while he went away for a while and I I loved it, but I only took that telescope out maybe three times for in three months that I had it, so... Yeah. Just yeah, the sheer just, weight, the sheer bulk of Yeah, it was really heavy, really hard to carry around. If I had something like that, I'd I'd need like an observatory or some something some kind of permanent housing to keep it in. Sure, sure. So so the twelve inch for you then is it the right compromise between big glass but yep. easy to set up and easy to carry. Yeah, I can pick up the tube of this telescope and carry it I don't know. I could carry it across town if I needed to. It's not yeah. super heavy. It's enough for, it's big, it's oblong and weird to carry, but it's not super heavy, so sure. I haven't hurt myself yet. <laughs> so that's obviously on the job side, so that's, you're pushing it all the time, aren't you? So you go across the sky, yeah. so they... Yep. No electricity, no motors, no guiding, so it's just look at it and you can see the, the stars just kind of trailing across the eyepiece and then you just give it a little nudge. <laughs> So I saw on your YouTube channel, then you do some lunar sketching as well, because of course for lunar, then you need high power. Yep. So you're obviously having to nudge it. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. You have to do a lot of nudging with uh, lunar observations with the Dobsonian, which I haven't done yet. I haven't done any sketches through this telescope. Oh, not through the big uh, one. Oh, okay. the moon. Um, I was using my CG5 mount and my uh, Celestron C8 SCT. Yep. This is so much more convenient for me as, as far as sketching goes. So when you drive out to your dark sky side, then you literally put the mount down, put the tube on top of the mount, yep. put your accessories out, and you you go. Yep. Good to go. Yep, the, it came with a fan installed, so I actually hook up the fan, take the dust cover off, and kind of let the air flow through it to kind of cool it down, because as you can see, I keep it stored inside. So when you go someplace and it's like 33 degrees outside, it's much colder than in your house. Of course, yeah. And it gets really warm in the tube, so you need to push all that warm air out So and cool down the mirrors. So that helped quite a bit. Ah, excellent. So now you're down the path then of you've observed everything with your old 8-inch telescope and everything is going to look twice as good and twice as detailed. So you can start again and you can start literally back on your first objects and, and work your way through the, through the list again. It's funny, I keep doing this. So my very first telescope was a Celestron Astromaster 114 EQ. So it was like, what, four and a half, five inch telescope. It's relatively small, decent starter telescope. Um, and I checked out a bunch of stuff with that, a lot of Messier objects, planets. And then I moved on to a Omni XLT 150, which I believe is also made by Celestron. So that's a six inch mirror. And I was... I went back and viewed everything all over again. I was like, oh wow, the Orion Nebula looks amazing through this telescope. Oh, brilliant, brilliant. Yeah. And then, and then after that, I got a eight inch SCT and I started all over again. I went back to M1 and M42, M57, M27, all, all the staple objects. I'm just like, wow, these are amazing through this IP or this telescope. And now with this one, I'm doing it all over again. So oh, at some point I'm gonna start getting the objects I haven't looked at yet. Oh, I see. Well, when you get the 16 inch or the 20 inch, you'll have to start. <laughs> so we've got a friend of ours in the club. He's just bought a 22 inch obsession. Ooh, wow. And then you look at there, but you know, you need the step ladder. And then, oh, know, yeah. So that's yeah. the one thing I really like about this 12 inch. I do not need a step ladder. Uh, it, okay. You can stand at, I mean, if you're a kid, you'll need a step stool to get on sure. to get to the eyepiece. But this, you can stand at it. And I actually got an observing chair, which I don't. I don't have in the house right now. I actually left that out in the car. So, but yeah, that I can adjust. So even if the telescope is pointed almost straight up, I can still sit down at the eyepiece, oh, brilliant. which makes which makes sketching a lot better. Yeah. Well, there's, yeah. There's, they say that there's several upgrades you can do to your telescope. One is to put more gas in the fuel tank and drive to a darker site. Yeah. And two is sit down in the chair and then you'll you'll be able to look for longer and be more comfortable. Oh, absolutely. So and you do both. I. I think it was the guys on Actual Astronomy Podcast that said that they 
almost felt like they could see more detail in objects when they were sitting than when they were standing. And I feel like I agree with that. Yeah, no, that makes sense. That's I feel good. like I'm able to, yeah, I'm able to just sit there and focus. I'm not stressed, like standing and getting tired and fatigued from standing. I can just sit back and relax and really just focus on what I'm looking at. It makes sense, doesn't it? If you're comfortable and relaxed, you're, you're going to see more, aren't you? See yeah, more. absolutely. So, um, so if you well, so you've got the two eyepieces and the two inch eyepieces. What other eyepieces have you got in your in your collection? Um, there's only one other eyepiece that I really use a lot, and I actually bought this one at Neef. It's the LV Zoom eight to twenty four millimeter. It's is just it, a one and a quarter inch eyepiece. Is that a Vixen? And I, huh? The, the Vixen is it? LV Zoom. Um, I believe it is a Vixen. Yeah. Or oh, is it Barter? Barter, isn't it? The do the. Uh, Vixen LV series. Oh, yeah. Vixen LV. Yeah. But yeah, so this eyepiece has the 24, it's got a 24 oh, millimeter, okay. a 16 millimeter, 12 millimeter, and down to 8 millimeter. So you and have four eye piece, five eyepieces in one? Yeah, it just twists. It doesn't, it doesn't have the click lock, so really you can, you don't really know where you're at, so you do have to look. That's the one disadvantage of this eyepiece. Uh, like the, I believe the Bader has a click lock, which I'm considering getting next to replace this eyepiece. But this one has served me well for a good four years or so now. Oh, wow. Those are the main eyepieces I use. And I recently got a UHC filter, which comes in really handy for uh, helping with contrast. And in my Bortle 6 guys, I was able to actually uh, see the... Um, the Veil Nebula. Oh, did you? Oh, well done. Yeah. Yep. I, I had the telescope pointed at it and I was like, yeah, I can't see anything. Let me try the eyepiece. So I screwed it on, to, or the filter. So I screwed it onto the eyepiece, put it in, and I was just blown away. Wow. I was like, holy crap, I did not expect to see that. <laughs> so should we just jump back and then say, for those of you who don't know then, so when you're looking at these, it's emission nebula, isn't it? Yeah, yep. nebula that are glowing and they emit in certain wavelengths. And the UHC filter blocks off everything except for the wavelengths that the nebula is emitting, uh, emitting at. So that yeah, really believe... enhances the contrast and makes them easier to see against the background sky. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I believe that the astronomic lets through O3 and H beta. But if you want to see O3, you really want to get a dedicated yeah. filter, which will probably be my next one. Yeah. So I used to have an O3 filter. And yep. what I found was because, so, so if you're looking at the veil, the veil's this beautiful arcing nebulosity, isn't it? And it's, the field of view is full of stars. And then yep. you screw the O3 filter in and like three quarters of the stars have disappeared. So the yeah, view I, I found was much less sort of aesthetically pleasing, although the nebula is much easier to see. And then you, so when I use the ultra high contrast filter, of course, more of the stars are visible. So I actually found, although it's, you know, 85, 90% of the filter in the sense of the performance, it's not quite as contrasty as an O3. The overall view I found much more pleasing with the UHC than an O3. I don't know if that's what, have you had a chance to look through an O3 yet? I have not had a chance to look through an O3 yet, just the UHC and I had an Orion Ultra Block, which I think was pretty much the same thing, kind okay. of cut back on light pollution, enhanced the contrast, which helped quite a bit in the light polluted skies, but yeah, the main one I use now is the UHC. Yeah, that makes sense. So, what was your thoughts on the Veil Nebula then? When that must be quite a sight through your. Oh, that, well. that was amazing. Now, now every night I've been out since then, I put that filter in and I point at it and I just observe. So I can see the, so there's the east and the west veil, and then in between them there's even fainter nebula, which I have not been able to see yet. So I don't know if I just haven't been in dark enough skies or if it's just not visible. Um, I have a Sky Atlas interstell Interstellarium, I believe it's called. Yeah, the, um, the new model tells is you, from Germany. Yeah, it, it tells you what filters are best for the object that you're looking at. And it actually says O3 is best for the Veil Nebula. So maybe, maybe if I had an O3 filter, then I'd be able to see some of that fainter stuff in between the East and Western Veil. I see. So that no, is a beautiful sight, isn't it? So you've done well to catch that from a light polluted. Oh yeah, it, it is beautiful. And it's funny because um, I think it was last weekend or the weekend before I took my telescope over to a friend's house because he hasn't looked through this telescope yet and he loves looking at 
at space with me. So I brought the telescope over and I put the filter in and I, I aimed it at the, at the veil nebula. And I was like, all right, take a look at this real quick. And he looked at it. He goes, it looks just like the sketch you, you posted the other day. I was like, oh, nice. Oh, brilliant. <laughs> what an endorsement. That's just what you want to hear, isn't it? Oh yeah, absolutely. It's like, all right, well, I did do a good job then. <laughs> so what I, this is one of the things why I love, you know, looking at the night sky is, you know, you're looking at, what is it, a 5,000 year old supernova remnant? Yeah. yeah. You're seeing it, you know, with, with your own eyes. It's amazing. It really is. Anytime, like looking at a galaxy that's like 200 light years away and it's just like 200 million light years away, not 200 light years, but yeah, yeah 200 million light years away. And it's just like, that was a really long time ago and I'm just <laughs> now seeing that light. <laughs> that is amazing. It's isn't just it? mind blowing thinking about that kind of stuff. Yeah. So when you're out in the forest, when you're at your dark sky, do you get any interesting wildlife being in North America? What's, what's it like there? Well, I haven't gone out into the wildlife a whole lot. Uh, last night was really my first night doing that. And um, when I first got there, I kept hearing weird, creepy noises out in the in the woods nearby. Because where I went to was right next to a lake. So, I mean, I'm sure there were animals going there and drinking water and, you know, doing whatever animals do at nighttime. And I just heard these, these noises through the woods. I kept turning on my flashlight and pointing it into the woods, seeing if I could catch a pair of eyes somewhere yeah. but i didn't run into anything i heard some foxes off in the distance but i'm not too worried about foxes it's it's the bears and the coyotes i'm more worried about <laughs> it's the ones that you don't hear though that's the problem yeah exactly <laughs> but, and, and, and the worst ones are the ones with two legs yep yeah, yeah. other people <laughs> or just bears standing up yeah, but yeah, right. yeah well at least you've got a big telescope to sort of hide behind when the bear does come <laughs> So do you go by yourself or do you, are you part of a club? Do you go with other people? Um, I am not part of a club. I do go, I went out by myself. I'll, like I said, sometimes I go over to my friend's house. He also lives in Bordeaux Four Skies. Um, and I've got another friend who lives, uh, I think he lives on the edge of a Bordeaux Three slash Bordeaux Four Skies. So just a little bit darker. I haven't been out there in a while. And then in the heart of the Adirondacks in some of the darkest skies, I want to say it's like a portal two, oh, wow. maybe a portal one. There is a observatory, uh, Adirondack public observatory. And they're open every Friday if it's clear and you can go there with your own telescope or view through their telescopes. It's been a few years since I've been out there though. I would like to go back out. It's just, it's like a two hour drive. So I don't, I don't make it out there a whole lot. Well, that makes sense, doesn't it? The problem is, yeah. it's, it's not the two-hour drive there, it's the two-hour drive back when you're tired yeah, exactly. and cold. And... Yeah, yeah, because you pack it in at three o'clock in the morning, and you're like, oh, I won't be home till five. <laughs> yes, yeah. 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 And so um, we, we, we've got some dark skies near near us. There's some military land up just up the road. on the we, We're about, I don't know, 50 minutes south of Stonehenge. And if you go north of Stonehenge, there's a lot of military land. So if okay. you set up to the side of it, obviously you can't go into it, uh, but you know, there's it's very few villages and, and street lights. So it must be, I think, a, a, a green zone, they call it, you know, portal three, four. So, you know, you can see the Milky Way and Coma Berenices and all that sort of thing. So it's not too bad, but uh, we don't have to worry about bears and coyotes and stuff. It's, <laughs> oh, that would be nice. Yeah. I think one of the only encounters I really had with any wildlife was a skunk walk by me when I was out one night. So you don't want them spraying all over you, do you? No, <laughs> no, definitely not. But I, I was out there just calm and quiet. I saw he was walking by and I was like, well, if I don't move, I should be okay. Yeah. And if you don't make a big deal, they're not going to make a big deal either. So they'll just walk right past you. He wasn't fussed at all, was he? he just... No, he was just carrying on, digging in the dirt, looking for grubs or whatever they eat. Whatever kind of scoop, yeah. <laughs> Do we go on to sketching then in more detail? So have you got a, a sketching setup? How do you, how do you, what's your workflow? What's your process then? All right, well. That's a very open-ended question, so I can be quiet. Yeah. <laughs> have a sip of my tea. Well, I, uh, I use this little book, which is filled with black paper. And I use a white charcoal pencil and white pastel pencils to do my sketches. Uh, the very first sketch I did in this notebook was just a test of some moon craters. Oh, wow, look at that, that's amazing. That was, that was from an image inside, so it's a little more detailed than I'd probably do at an eyepiece. So but, you also yeah, got white and black charcoals. Yeah, so. and yep. this, 
that was my first moon crater sketch at the eyepiece. Is that Copernicus? I've seen your Copernicus yep. video. That... Yep. Oh, wow. Okay. Yep, that's Copernicus. That was back in February I did that. So that was through my 8-inch SCT when I did that one. So that's the notebook I use. I used to use a larger notebook and draw circles and make that my eyepiece view. But I actually had changed it up a bit with this notebook where I actually got rid of the circles and I just now sketch. So because with this telescope, the sky is moving and I got to nudge it. And sometimes I, I start sketching beyond the actual eyepiece, uh, okay. what I'm seeing. So I didn't want to restrict myself. So I, I made it a little bit wider field than I'm, I'm sketching. So I might use a, I might be viewing at 12 millimeters, but I might get the field of view of like a 24 millimeter eyepiece just because I'm not restricting myself to just that view. Gotcha. That makes sense. So do you put the stars down first and have the nebulosity? What's your... You know, that's a good question because I kind of go back and forth. Sometimes I'll, I'll place the stars, like if it's a, a galaxy, I'll, I'll draw the stars in and then I'll place the galaxy. Sometimes with a nebula, I'll, I'll put the stars in and then I'll put the nebula. But last night I did M33 and the very first thing I did was put M33 down. I, I put a rough idea of where it was so that I could kind of get the placement of the stars from there. Ah, uh, I see. So were you able to see the spiral arms? And... No, no, it was just a small little smudge. Yeah, I, so... All I really saw was the central core. Unfortunately, yeah. I couldn't see the, it's the spiral arms. It's surface brightness, isn't it? To... Yeah, it's... I mean, what is it marked as, like a magnitude six or something? And the surface brightness, I think, brings it to like a, I don't know, like a 12 or something. I'm not sure of the numbers off the top of my head, but it is really dim. I had never seen it through my eyepiece from the city, but since I was out in the middle of nowhere, yeah. I thought I'd try it. And I was like, okay, I can actually see it a little bit. Gotcha. Now that makes sense. I remember when I first started trying to find it, my binoculars. And I'm saying it's magnitude eight, and I can't, I could not see anything. And then, then you read, oh no, actually, it's really low surface brightness. So yeah. With a bit of dark skies and a bit of you know averted imagination, you think, well, maybe there's a little glow, or something. <laughs> yeah, and I did. I I sat there for a good twenty minutes just with my eye up to the eyepiece. I had my my one eye closed, and after a while, I just had to kind of cover that eye so I could so I wasn't straining it from from closing it and. I was like, come on, I just want to see a little bit of detail, a, a little bit of arm. That's all I want to see. And I, I couldn't make any of it out, yeah. though. So did you sketch it? Are we going to see a copy of your sketch? Or did you just look? Huh? Did you sketch M33 or did you... Oh, yeah. Yep. Get... I did a sketch of M33 and M, uh, NGC404. Oh, that's the one next to the bright star. What's it called? Yep. Uh, Mirac. 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 Mirac's yep. ghost, isn't it? Yep. Ah, yeah, I did an image of that years ago, and I was like, well, I want to try and do a sketch of it. So I, I did that last night just because it's a small galaxy next to a bright star, and I just I thought it was a pretty view through the eyepiece. So I needed to get that one down in my in my notebook. Gotcha. And it's pretty easy to find that one, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Just center Mirac in the eyepiece and just look for that faint, fuzzy, circular blob nearby. Gotcha. Yeah, it's nothing to see there, other than it's just a, a, a dim, faint galaxy next to a very bright yeah. star. Still amazing, though. I yeah. mean, I don't know the distance of it, but it's it's amazing object. So how do you choose objects to observe, then? You've obviously you've mentioned a few as we've been talking. Do you just have a favorite list? Are you working your way through a program? or? Um, well, I would love to start making an observing list. I've never actually sat down and made a list for observing. I just kind of go out and go, okay, we've got uh, Cygnus is up. Let's see what I can see in Cygnus. And I'll I'll just kind of jump around to different objects in Cygnus. And I'll be like, oh, I really like this open cluster. So then I'll just draw that. And if I'm kind of drawing a blank when I'm out there, I'll pull out my phone and use um, uh, Sky Safari or I use my Interstellarium book, my uh, Star Atlas. As so you're literally just, that part of the sky is e you know, easy to see tonight. Yeah, I haven't looked there before. Let's just work our way through at random whatever clusters and nebula I find. Yeah, I I did a couple times. I, I made a list of like six or seven objects of things I wanted to look at when I got out there. And I got out and I was like, nope, through the list and was like, let's just look at whatever I can. <laughs> oh, 
Because, uh, yeah. yeah, so I've, I've been trying to do the Herschel 400. Have you heard of that? Oh, yeah. Yep. Yeah. And it's one of those things. I think I started, I don't know, seven or eight years ago. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I still I, haven't made my way all the way through the Messier list yet. And I've been doing this for 11 years now. Have you <laughs> so what are you missing then? So let's go back to that then. So what are you missing in the Messier? The Southern Objects? Or? Oh, there's a there's a lot of them. A lot of the ones to the south that are low on the horizon yeah. in the summertime because the southern skies are, are washed out and it's really hard to make out much of anything down there. So I haven't seen much of that. So I think that's where a big chunk of what I'm missing is is all in the southern skies. So the, what, there's one Messier object from the UK I've only seen once, and that's an M M83. Oh, yep, yep. Which is, which is really far south. And right, in, you know, it's, it, it rises at, you know, um, dawn and sets at dusk. It just never seems to be visible. And I think I've seen it one night and it's low, low down on the horizon. And, you know, it's just a dim, a bit like your Mirax Ghost or M33. It's just this dim glow. Yeah. And I went to the Florida Star Party a few years ago, obviously pre-COVID. And it was up there, you know, it was, um, <laughs> it was 30 degrees higher in the sky or whatever it is. <laughs> it was easy to see and, you know, with a big, you know, one of the big dogs nearby, you could see spiral arms and stuff. And I thought, oh, definitely bored in the wrong country. <laughs> so um, so you, you literally just find things that interest you. And so you must have then, you know, well, like serendipitous discoveries. Wow, that's amazing. I didn't even know it was there. Yeah, there's been a couple of times where um, I've been looking and I'm just like, what is, what am I looking at? So I'll, I'll actually pull up uh, Sky Safari and I'll, I'll point towards where my telescope is pointing. I'm like, oh, that's a cluster of galaxies. That's what I'm looking at. That's cool. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Like uh, there's a cluster in Perseus that I randomly found one night. I was just kind of scanning the skies in that area. And I, I saw a bunch of little faint fuzzies. And I was like, what's going on here? I didn't know that there was a cluster of galaxies there. And I just stumbled across it. So which was uh, 1275, isn't it? That's the Perseus. I think so. Yeah. yeah. He says from memory. Yeah. And that's just yeah. why you literally just stumbled across and think, oh, that's interesting. I'll stop yep. there. Well, the very first deep sky object I ever saw through the eyepiece, I had no idea what I was doing. It was on an EQ mount. I didn't know what an EQ mount was. I just kind of set the mount down, put the telescope on it, and pointed it. I, uh, the very first thing I ever saw that was an actual deep sky object was NGC 457, the owl cluster in Cassiopeia. Oh, the little stick man with the arms. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Yep. That was the very first one that I discovered on my own. Oh, and I was that was amazing to me. I, I had no idea what it was. I was like, oh, it looks like it has eyes. Uh, and then I uh, went inside when I was done and I started looking in that area and I was like, hey, there it is. Oh, it's the owl cluster. That makes sense. Oh, that's brilliant. Oh, I love that. That's a brilliant story. <laughs> so have you, you, we've talked about your setup and we've talked about your approach and have you got any plans for, we all love talking about kit often because the weather's cloudy, but have you got any plans for upgrades, changes, accessories? What are, have you got any thoughts of the future? Oh, all right. Well, since this telescope is new, I'm cutting myself off on buying any more telescopes. Um, if I get another eyepiece, I'm thinking of getting the Bader Zoom. Uh, it's also an 8 to 24, but it has an adapter for to fit in the 2-inch eyepiece holder so that I can use my two inch filters on that. So if I wanna zoom in on something like a, a, a planetary nebula and I wanna zoom in on it, but I also wanna use the filter, I can if I get the Bader zoom. So I'm gonna probably get that at some point. I wanna get the O3 filter and I wanna get an H beta filter. Oh, so that's yeah, H beta cool. is, is last on the list because there's not a lot of objects that benefit from it. But I would absolutely love to see the Horsehide Nebula oh, through the great. IDs. And that's the that's the filter you need for that. Definitely, definitely. So we've got a friend in our club who's got an HB to filter. And uh, they, they always call it, that's the one you borrow. Yeah. And so we yeah. always say, oh, that's John's filter. For, you know, we need to borrow that to see that every winter when we go out to see the Horsehide Nebula. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, like I said, that, that filter, there's only a handful of objects that really benefit from it. So that's why I put it down at the end of my list, but I do want to get that this year, I think, before, you know, the that season is done with. I'd love to be able to get Horsehead in this year. Oh, we'll have no problems with your 12 inch from a dart site. You need a dart site though, obviously. Oh yeah, you? absolutely. Yeah. Maybe I'll take it to the observatory at that point yeah. and get down to the portal two skies. <laughs> yeah, well, you probably won't need a filter there. 
<laughs> so uh, yeah, because there's a there's a load of stuff in there, and that that whole region of Orion is full of little stuff. Yeah, I, I can't go wait. to the Orion Nebula, but there's loads of other stuff around us, isn't there, worth hunting out? Yeah, yeah. There was an open cluster in I think it's in Orion. Um, it's in that area. It's I can't remember what it the designation, but it's called the Thirty Seven Cluster because the stars actually form the shape of the number 37. And it's funny because in the mirror, you don't know that because it's flipped. And I'm just sketching it and didn't know what was going on. And I looked it up and I was like, why are they calling it the 37 cluster? I don't see it. And I mirrored my sketch and I was like, oh, there it is. You can see the number 37. So um, you talked about sketching. You showed us your moon sketches. We talked about deep sky sketching and your plans for the future. Do you do any planetary or comets or variable stars, or is it just deep sky observing you enjoy? Well, so I'm going to share this, this sketch. So I don't do planetary sketches, and there's a reason. It's, well, I should practice. I should really practice my planetary sketching because as of right now, this is what Saturn looks like when I try to sketch it. Oh, I see. That's like one of Galileo's <laughs> drawings, isn't it? A little weird, a little <laughs> oblong, but... I'm sure if I practice a bit, it'll, it'll get a little bit better. But no, I, I haven't really done any sketching of planets, just moon, um, deep sky objects. I did a really rough, quick sketch of um, Neowise when it was visible in the sky. Um, I was actually able to see it in my Bortle 6 backyard. But to the north, there were trees, so I had to keep moving my chair, and I was using binoculars, so I was... I had to move my chair, grab my sketching equipment, oh. kind of aim my binoculars up and then sketch. And then by the time I look up again, it was behind the trees. So I had to move. <laughs> uh, it was it was a pain. I only really got about 12 minutes with it. So it wasn't super detailed. There wasn't much to see in it, but I just wanted to say that I got it. There was, that was a beautiful view there, wasn't it? Of, of yeah. What I yeah, it really was. I have done a couple double stars. Those are really nice, especially when they're colorful. Like you have a blue star next to a, an orange star. That's I love seeing things like that. And I actually have colored pencils for when, when I'm doing double stars, I can add color to it. Oh, yeah, that is beautiful. So that was all. Those was lenticular clouds over there on the yeah, left? Yeah, that's right, yeah. Oh, that so is we, amazing. Yeah, Neowise was amazing. I'd yeah. Love to see and it it's, again. So Neowise is actually how I met the guy who let me borrow his 16-inch Dobsonian. Oh, wow. So, yeah, so when it first started becoming an evening comet, I went over, so in Plattsburgh, we're right on the shore of Lake Champlain, so I went to a, a local area where you can kind of see to the north, and I'm just waiting for the sun to go down, and, and the sun just started to set, and the sky's just starting to get dark, and somebody pulls up, and I'm standing there, looking up in the sky, kind of trying to find where Neowise is. And I hear somebody in the distance go, you looking for the comet too? And I was like, I'm trying to, but I'm not able to see it. So I went over and I started chatting with him. And and I actually just met up with him on Friday night to do a little bit of um, local public observing in the city, just checking out Jupiter and Saturn. Yeah. Yeah. That's brilliant. So through luck, you've met another friend, haven't you? Yep. Yep. Yeah, this, I love this hobby. It's yes. a great hobby. Good stuff, isn't it? And you get to chat to people in England as well, you know. So. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> bring, it, bring us all together. Yeah. And yes, and this is now going out to, I don't know, literally dozens of people, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, another question I'd like to ask people as well is, what, what is a cheap accessory? What cheap accessories have you bought that have sort of punched above their weight, a great enhanced? So if you're looking for people getting Christmas lists, what would you recommend, say, this thing works really well, but it's actually surprisingly cheap. Um, I had bought a 32 millimeter eyepiece. It was from High Point Scientific. I think it was like thirty dollars. Thing's amazing. It's, for the price, it was a it was a great dollars. eyepiece. Yeah, I, I want to say it was thirty dollars. Oh, wow, maybe I'm lying now. I'm not sure. <laughs> but it was cheap. That's the key point, isn't it? The yeah, yeah. It was a really cheap eyepiece. I didn't feel bad buying it. I was like, ah, oh, this isn't too bad. Okay, it's $42. So yeah, that was pretty cheap. Yeah. $42 eyepiece and it works great. It was one and a quarter inch. And it got a lot of use up until I got this telescope and replaced my my one and a quarters with two inch eyepieces. Wow. So the yeah. markets we had, you don't have to splash your money, is it? That's the that's the key point, isn't it? Yeah. And 
And, you know, I would definitely recommend sticking with one and a quarter inch eyepieces if you're looking for, you know, budget friendly because the two inch eyepieces are really expensive. Like these Aperture ones I bought are some of the cheaper ones and they're great views. But if you compare them to some of the more expensive ones, it's like, well, now I see why it's cheap. But, <laughs> but yeah, eyepieces, I don't know. I'm trying to think of some other cheap gear that I've bought. I bought a Zoom L eyepiece kit when I first got into astronomy it came with a 32 millimeter eyepiece came with a 12 millimeter a 6 millimeter and I want to say a 4 millimeter and a 2x Barlow the 2x Barlow I still use to this day it's it's worked great and it also came with a moon filter which I still use and some color filters which I only use the blue one for Jupiter okay which so that all came in handy and I want to say that was only a little over a hundred dollars so that ended up being pretty well worth its money. The four it four millimeter eyepiece. I mean, how often are you really going to use something like that? <laughs> you must have that jammed up against your eye. Four millimeters. Yeah, and it's such a small exit pupil. You really do have to have it up to your eye. If you're wearing glasses, you're not going to be able to see through that eyepiece at all. So for high power views, it's it's often I prefer to use a Barlow. Yeah, I know you're putting more glass in the way, but it's just so much easier to observe with through yeah. a ten millimeter eyepiece, say, and a times two Barlow than it is with a five millimeter. Yeah, and that's kind of the reason I went with the zoom eyepiece because it goes down to the eight millimeter, and then you put it in a Barlow, and now you got a four millimeter, and you still have a wider piece of glass to put your eye up to, and a better. It's easier to see what you're looking at, so yeah, that comes in really handy. So do you use your do you use your zoom eyepiece in preference to the regular eyepiece? Yeah, um, so I've got the two inch eyepiece that's thirty eight, the two inch that's a thirty millimeter, and then my anything that I would use a twenty four to eight millimeter eyepiece. That's I use my zoom. So I I really only take those three with me when I go out. So you got your finder eyepiece, your very wide field of view eyepiece, and then yep. your observing eyepiece. Is that how you yep. break it down? Yep. And then just swap the filter in as you can. Yeah, exactly. So, what advice would you give? So, if you met yourself, if you met a young Mike now, Michael Rector now, what would you? What advice would you give to him starting out? So if they, now you're a few years down the hobby. Oh, don't let the astrophotography parts get to you. Just, just put it down. Do the sketching. Because when I got really frustrated with the astrophotography i put away astronomy for over a year like i didn't really go out a whole lot if i did it'd go, i'd go out and i just i wasn't really into it so so don't let that frustrate you if 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 it's too much and it's frustrating you put it down put an eyepiece in enjoy the view enjoy the darkness enjoy the night sky or just go out in a chair or lay, lay in the grass and just look up at the stars watch the satellites pass by because there's thousands of them now. So enjoy those if you want. <laughs> uh, watch for shooting stars, anything to just get you out there and enjoying the night sky. Just don't let the the frustration of, of da data collection get to you. Just, yeah. just step back and relax. Take a breather. <laughs> I, think that's something, I mean, that's not true of astronomy, isn't it? That's true of life as well, isn't it? Enjoy yeah, life. Yeah, yeah. Just yeah. So how do people follow you, Mike, then, so if they want to follow follow up the conversation? Well, on on Facebook, I have my personal page, and then I have a, a business page, I guess you want to call it. Um, it's Adirondack Astronomy. You can find me there on Facebook. And on Twitter, I'm at Adirondack Astro. So you can follow me there. That's probably a good spot to go to see see my most recent posts and sketches. I do post those over on Facebook, but I'm not nearly as active on Facebook as I am on Twitter. Okay. Like when I'm out at a dark sky location, I'll put a red filter on my on my phone and I'm out there tweeting while I'm while I'm observing. I like in between observing, yeah. Yeah. Like last night when I was done sketching NGC four oh four, I hopped in my car and turned it on to heat up turned on the heat just to kind of warm up my toes a little bit and I was like successfully sketched NGC four oh four. It was a great view and Mirac was beautiful and orange and just kind of given my my observations while I'm out there. Oh, I and I was talking you. about, you know, oh, I just heard some weird noises in the woods. Hopefully it's not a bear, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. Oh, if you ask me to an hour, send help. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> so, does, so that, well, that's a question for you then. Does that not affect your night vision or do you? 
Um, well, a lot of times when I do pull out the phone, I will either put an eye patch over my observing eye or I'll just close my observing eye while I'm looking at the phone. But I also have a red filter so that it, it blocks a lot of the brighter light and it's really dim. Oh, so I'm able to able to keep my night vision mostly intact. Gotcha. Yeah. So I've, I met you then, or not met you, but first came across you um, through your YouTube because you publish your This Is How I Sketch yep. videos. and. That's also worth following as well on the Adir is it Adirondack Astronomy YouTube yep. channel. Yep. yep. So oh, I should have mentioned that when yeah. you asked me how people can get a hold of me. Yeah, <laughs> you can follow me here on YouTube on Adirondack Astronomy. So anything to do with the Adirondack Astronomy, you're the man. Yeah. Yeah. So how do you... So I've tried recording myself at night, and it's really hard because, of course, you want total darkness for your eyes yep. to go up to the dark. But, of course, the camera wants total brightness. Yep. So that it can record the, so how do you manage that? Because I've got bits of red tape over my light and it's, you... <laughs> so this is funny. Um, usually what I do is I have my, my, um, my headlamp with the red light on and that's usually what I use. And I used to like kind of balance it on my phone as I'm holding the phone, pointing it at me. But even that light is really bright. And when I sketch, I use a book light and I actually colored a sandwich bag oh, red. That? Yeah, that's a sandwich bag on a book light. Oh, I see. So, so it just gives you a red light, and it's got three settings, dim, brighter, and way too bright Doesn't for any yeah. kind of skies. But yeah, so that's that's what I use. It just clips onto my, my notebook that I sketch on. And that's I actually clipped that onto my phone last night when I was out in a dark sky site, put on the dim setting, kind of kept it so it wasn't pointing the bright lights right in my face, but that seemed to work really good. So that's my new method. That's the way to do it. Yep. So I and met then, a, a lady in, in the UK, she's called Mary McIntyre, and she has yep. a similar setup. But we've got a, we get the type of candy, get a quality street chocolates, and some of them come in a red wrapper. So the first thing you have to do is go and buy a box of these chocolates. So you can then eat yep. them and have the red wrappers to then wrap around <laughs> the flash. <laughs> See, that's brilliant. I, I just used red marker for mine. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Should have bought your red candy first. And then this is the camera I actually use when I sketch clips on to, this is a DJI action camera. Oh, okay. Yep. Yeah. So it does time lapse and it actually has a really good view at nighttime. And I have this clip that just clips onto my notebook. So that's you know, clip on notebook would be right here. And that's about how far away the camera is when I'm when I'm sketching. So it's not and then I just have the light clipped on right next to it shining onto the notebook. So that's how I get that lit up. It wasn't easy to figure this out. Yeah. <laughs> I've, I've gone through a similar learning curve with yourself and you say it's really hard trying to you course want minimal brightness. And, yeah. And of course, the camera wants maximum brightness. So. And then when you get at home and you do your video editing, you start cranking up the brightness and then it brings out all the noise in your video. It's like, oh, no, this is the same problem I had with photography, too. Too much noise. Because, <laughs> of course, if you're imaging, the, the camera doesn't suffer from that loss of yeah. light vision, does it? So it doesn't matter if you shine a light. Around. Yeah, exactly. But for video, I mean, you're not doing long exposure video, so you got to have the lights. Oh, that's been really useful. Well, thank you for your time, Mike, and uh, it'll be really nice to chat. Thank you very much. I had a lot of fun. Yeah, it's good stuff. All right, well, I'll let you to your day. It's, um, we're going to have our dinner now, and you must be just about getting ready for lunch. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, one in the afternoon right now, so. So, so yeah, I'm going to go and grab a bite to eat, and I don't know what I'm going to do today. Probably just organize all my gear, because I actually just brought it in from my car this morning. I got home and I was just like, I'll just leave it out there overnight. <laughs> you were serving last night? Oh, I always hadn't realized you were serving last night. Oh, pretty yeah, good. yeah. Yeah, I, d I got home around 11, 11.30 last night. I wasn't out super late. It was cold and I, I got two objects in, NGC 404 and M33. I got those two in, but I did a bunch of, I just kind of hopped around just to kind of, because this was a new site to me. So I wanted to see all the different things I could see and how they looked there compared to at home. So so I was just out there just observing and checking out all the different views of, or all the new views of the same objects I've seen. <laughs> oh, that sounds wonderful. Well, I'm glad you had a good evening. And so thank you very much for your time. I'll look forward to catching up with you online. So my thanks to Michael Rector from Adirondack Astronomy. Loads of advice and tips there, really practical session. So I hope you enjoyed that. As always, don't forget to subscribe and I look forward to bringing you more videos as we explore the night sky.